Hello and welcome to the Choir Riot where we talk film, television, and media. Media? And media. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am Ainsley and if you are new here, I really like talking about older films specifically and finding new things to watch, things that may be obscure, and also talking about some of the more popular films that even someone who doesn't watch old movies may like. It seems that a lot of the films I tend to talk about are film noir or made anywhere from the 1930s to the 70s especially, but I do touch on some films that are made in the 80s. And I, I and sometimes uh, of more recent fare. Just not so recently. <laughs> if you enjoy this channel and want to subscribe, you can put some recommendations for me or some things you would like to see on the channel in the comments below. And you can also always comment on a community post with anything you would like to see on the future or like to see in the future on this channel. I do have a list of things that I want to do eventually in the future and I kind of schedule a little bit ahead. That way I know obviously what I've watched, what I'm going to research, what I need to know more about, but I also like to kind of surprise myself a, a little bit. If you are returning from the previous video, you probably realize that I am in a different place. I wanted to stay in my living room because I really like the setup there, but even with uh, certain things with my sound, it just wasn't the best place to be right now because it it doesn't have a door to close, so it just it was a little a little bit too more echoey on my. A house tends to carry sound really well and I really like my office area but I need to fix it up to be a little bit more studio-esque so it's just a lot easier for me to to film in really I hope that this is okay I'm go I'm gonna like fix it up so it looks a little bit more nice and it's not necessarily as busy but I just, I'm not 100% sure what I want to do right now. With all of that being said, I'm going to finish my ramblings so we can discuss today's subject, The Bigamist. If you are not familiar with The Bigamist, it is a public domain film that was released in 1953. It is a film noir drama about a, about a bigamist. Like a lot of film noirs, it does still maintain some levity that allows you a laugh here or there. And I will tell you a little bit more about those funny moments in the future. In the future, like it's gonna be a super long time at another point in this video. <laughs> if you don't wanna be spoiled, I highly recommend checking out The Bigamist on various platforms as it is in the public domain. And because of that, you may find yourself viewing a version that's not very well done or made or because you know when things are in the public domain you'll find a, a bootleg of a bootleg of a bootleg and it just doesn't look as pretty. I also know that there are colorized versions out there and they suck um, especially in a film noir that's in a film that's made in black and white it can take away something from it and I actually watched this the Big Mist for the first time in the colorized version and it was very difficult to get through. It just doesn't look good and it, it doesn't feel like the movie. It really removes something from it. So I will link the version that I watched that is actually on YouTube in the description box below along where else you can find it either free or through a subscription. So without further ado, let's discuss how The Bigamist takes on patriarchy. When I first heard of this film, I was shocked to find that it was made and released in 1953. While the 1950s saw the decline in how important the Hayes Code was to the industry with more directors and screenwriters going for it, to so to speak there's still certain things that they just weren't able to touch and I feel like bigamy was definitely one of them. 
after all, you have not only infidelity, but you have a man who is literally married to two different women, and he's breaking the law there as well. And of course, this being a film noir, that means we are following a morally gray character, and in this case, we are following Harry Graham, who is the bigamist this film is named after really glad that I found this film because it is directed by Aya Lupino, who is both an actress and director. A lot of you may know her from the episode of The Twilight Zone in which she directed, and she obviously shows quite a bit of talent. This was the last film that she directed before in like 12 years when she ended up going and directing another film by which the the title actually escaped me, but it is uh, one of my favorite Disney films that like not, it's one of my favorite Haley Mills Disney films. It's a great little 1960s comedy that she ended up directing and during that time between The Bigamist and The Trouble with Angels, The Trouble with Angels, The Trouble with Angels. She was actually directing quite a bit of television, really honing those skills. And I mean, she was already a prime director and her directing was praised for her work on both The Bigamist and Hitchhiker and really everything that she's done. She's a true talent. So I highly recommend checking out The Bigamist and other work that she has done. Director Ida Lupino also stars in the film alongside Edmund O'Brien, Edmund Gwynn, and Joan Fontaine. The Bigamist is the first film noir directed by a woman, and it's often wrongly considered the first film in which a woman both directs and stars, though this is the first film where a woman both directs and stars since the silent period. Lupino and screenwriter Collier Young produced the film through their independent film company, The Filmmakers. Collier Young was previously married to Lupino and at the time of filming was married to Fontaine. A film noir family drama, Lupino and cinematographer George E. Discant utilizes several techniques that liken it to the noir style. A scene that featured Lupino and Fontaine looking at each other, was an inside joke and the script managed to resemble the scriptwriter's life. This was not lost on critics and others in the industry. There were many mentions of Santa Claus because Edmund Gwynn, who portrays Mr. Jordan, was best known at the time and is probably still best known today for his portrayal of Santa Claus in Miracle on 34th Street. The film does follow and focus on Harry Graham, who is a bigamist. The film does not argue for bigamy, and it doesn't really argue against monogamy. However, it is very deep in the way it handles this subject. Like other film noirs, the focus is on our morally gray protagonist. Like many noirs, we already know the what of it, we just don't know how this all happened. How did Harry end up married to two women? The Bigamist is more critical of patriarchy than anything else. The film allows the audience to both sympathize with Harry while still condemning his actions that victimize both of these women and essentially turn their life into turmoil. It leaves us to question what will happen once Harry goes to prison and what will happen once he gets out. Many have commented that the film's ambiguous ending was far more ambiguous than was often allowed for at the time. See, the Hays Code wanted it to be very black and white in the way any type of criminal activity was handled. Either they are to die or go to prison. But here things are a little bit more open-ending because we don't know if he's gonna be welcomed back into the lives of either of these women. And my hope is that he's not because he does have a lot to learn. And I do sympathize with Harry as we are supposed to as an audience, but I even sympathize with the women more because for many reasons. The Bigamist initially follows social worker Mr. Jordan, who is investigating the Graham family when they want to adopt a child. Mr. Jordan is 
very intent on doing everything right, and he ends up mentioning to one of the cleaners. If you had made a mistake once, you wouldn't want to ever let it happen again. Not where a child is involved. No. When he does mention this to the cleaner, we know exactly why he is gung-ho on finding everything he can about this family. And by this time, he's already suspicious of Harry Graham because of his reaction to them needing to really go into their life and find out everything about them. He wants them to he wants them to sign a consent form and he notices the hesitation and the overall look and demeanor of Harry Graham where his wife is a lot more willing to let everything go. Mr. Jordan ends up going to Los Angeles where Harry has an office so he can investigate and get to know him more and really learn why Harry is the way he is. He doesn't seem to trust him in the same way that he trusts his wife Eve. And while there he ends up going to an address that he finds in the Yellow Pages. Or not the Yellow Is it found in the Yellow Pages or is that just business? I'm sorry, it's been a long time. So in the phone book, he ends up finding his address and goes there to surprise him. And he doesn't initially realize that things are off until he hears a baby crying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you haven't seen this film, not only does Harry Graham or Harrison Graham have another wife, he also has started a family with this woman, even though his other wife Eve is unable to have children. And that's another thing that really shocked me about this movie is that not only does it deal with bigamy and infidelity and all of that, it also does deals with infertility and adoption and everything that goes with that. I also appreciate how this film not only handles adoption but handles everything that goes into it and handles the work of a social worker who might be doing a little bit more than uh, other social workers would be doing and be doing at the time. I'm not particularly, uh, I don't have that particular knowledge of what social workers exactly do in the process of either fostering or adoption, but he really goes out there and tries to get the info because it's a child. You're not just handing them over a toy or handing, handling them a human being, um, they're, which they're going to bring into their family and they're gonna take care of. And so it was great to see adoption really be treated like a serious subject. My only qualm is that there are times where they refer to what will be their child and what is a child as it. So I don't know if that's just more uh, language and how it was used, but like I feel like uh, them, um, him or her would have been uh, a lot much a lot better to use. The bigamist really takes on patriarchy and its effects on people while looking specifically at Harry Graham and spending the majority of time with him, we do get to spend time with both of his wives, even Phyllis. Phyllis is not originally from Los Angeles and she's a little bit more of a free spirit, uh, a hard worker, and the same goes in that sense for Eve because she because of her infertility and uh, what she's had to go through and finding that out and all of the the tests that she's had to take, she's really thrown herself into work. And apparently prior to that, she didn't work for the company uh, that is owned by her husband, but they end up running it together. And it tells us that that is where a lot of her time and energy is focusing on. And this causes Harry to be lonely and he ends up seeking solace in another woman beginning with flirtation and she's of course not going to realize that he's in a relationship or married to another woman and you're thinking just talk to her just talk to her and i mean even today when anyone but especially men feel a certain way they can often be taught not to like, oh, just keep that to themselves. And of course that can be different for everybody and I'm not a man and so that's not the experience that I would be living. But 
people regardless do tend to keep a lot of that to themselves and I just know like patriarchy it doesn't just affect women it also affects men and in this case it is greatly affecting Harry who is finding it difficult to be honest with his wife about what he is filming what he is feeling I think he f is afraid to open up about his own loneliness and his pain and say hey like I want us to be able to spend time together when I'm home and all of that so in a sense I, I think it's, just, it's him being afraid to open up and be open with what he is feeling thanks to the good old patriarchy saying that's not what men do and it's also important to remember that this is the 1950s and it's going to be a little bit different than today but there's still a lot that those of us in the year 2024 yes the 20 the two that the 21st century we're in the 21st century we're in the 2020s um in my last video if you didn't say it didn't see it i said 1924 twice did not catch it so we we do know we're in the 2020s now i promise you this <laughs> harry is not devoid of blame in this situation mr jordan comes to him and he ends up telling him the story of how this all happened so we go back in time and find out how harry or harrison graham ends up marrying to another woman that isn't his wife eve and whom mr jordan knows and mr jordan though very upset about the situation and he wants to go to the police and that's what he wants to do first he allows harry to tell him what the hell happened how this happened and in the other room is where phyllis is sleeping while he tells him this story and one of the things that makes this incredibly sad is you know that both of these women's lives are going to be turned up completely upside down because of Harry's actions. It's important to note he is 100% the bad guy here and he also knows he is the bad guy here. And it's one of those situations where you find out that he, even in times where he's really tried to make it right, he's so scared of hurting either of these women. And there is this point where Phyllis, he ends up trying to leave Phyllis and Phyllis says something and he, I don't, I wish, even in that moment, if he was to, if he was just to be more honest with her, and I don't know, it just it's a it's a whole ass mess. There are plenty of things that patriarchy affects, and it affects everyone regardless of gender, sex, sexuality, and age. And when it comes to the character of Eve. She's this very loving and nurturing person. She's hardworking and she puts so much self into her, into the company. And it shows that she's an incredible businesswoman. She's an incredible saleswoman and she really holds everything down. And it doesn't treat you, it doesn't treat either character Phyllis and Eve as if they have done anything wrong in this situation because they haven't. The thing that Eve is going through is that she is kind of overworking herself and throwing herself into work because of her struggles with infertility and her want and desire to be a mom. And it's beautiful to see in any film but especially in a film from the 1950s that shows how infertility can affect someone's men mentality and how they handle themselves and for her it's almost ignoring those feelings and yes she wants to adopt with her husband but even when you're able to find this way to be a parent there's still going to be that sense of loss there and this is the 21st century this is 2024 and i am not somebody who's really having the desire to have children but the thought of not being able to have children is still uh, very effective it it really affects someone because even if you don't have maybe this and this is obviously not everyone not every woman or person who is able to have a child or has the equipment to have a child has that desire but that doesn't mean that if somebody was to tell them that they can't have children that it's not going to affect them in some sort of way because 
there's so much that tells women that they're supposed to want to have children, they're supposed to be able to have children, and all of these things that it ends up affecting someone. And there's also things that men are told that they're supposed to do and want, and things that uh, they're not supposed to do and feel. And, and it's those things that are affecting all of these characters and that are affecting these relationships and these things have affected specifically specifically the relationship between Harry and Eve. We're really gonna see moments in which Eve is really doing her best and thinking that this is what she needs to do and she's not really communicating herself and that is certainly something that's not a failure of hers. It's just something that people didn't have the language to discuss what it means to struggle with infertility. And it, it's really sad to see how that affects both Harry and how that affects Eve. And in, in turn, it ends up affecting everybody as well. Upon its release, the film was a critical and commercial success. I was actually really surprised to find that it was praised the way that it was. The thing that was of course praised the most was the direction by Ida Lupino, but so were the performances by all of the actors, as well as the script by Young. Howard Thompson of the New York Times referred to The Bigamist as the filmmaker's best offering to date. The film has further received acclaim since its release being featured in Stephen J. Schneider's 1001 Films to Watch Before You Die. I've put various articles that are more recent in the description box below for you to check out where people talk about the bigamist and how it holds up, how it takes on the patriarchy and all of those things. I read a few articles because when I watched it initially, I wasn't particularly fond of the way the character of Harry was handled. And then when I watched it a second time, I was more sympathetic towards him. I was more understanding of the way the character was handled and the way the subject was handled. And of course right now there is a, a lot of issues in regards to media literacy. It just seems to not be, not be a thing right now. People are really struggling with it. And I think a big part of that is because of social media, because people feel as if they, oh, uh, this subject is maybe a bit taboo or this subject, you know, it's, it's something bad. And just because something is bad, you're talking about a certain action that a character takes or a, a certain character trait. And the reality is, is that these things are what make a character interesting. And just because a screenwriter, author, director are doing their job and these are the things they are discussing and talking about and this is the subject of the movie. And it doesn't mean that these are things that they say, oh, should be done. It's not they're advocating for that to happen. It's not that they're endorsing that to happen. And I've just seen a lot of that on social media where there's just this complete lack of media literacy. And the reality is, is that someone may do something, it does, it's not executed particularly well, or maybe it's just not executed in a way that the majority of the audience or a great portion of the audience is going to take well. And that's just how the cookie crumbles, baby. Um, but in the 1950s, things were going to be handled a little bit different. The way they approach a subject may be a bit different. And I would say there may be some things that I would do different today if I was to approach this. But some of the things that I initially thought when it came to the first, my first viewing of this um, has definitely changed. I do like that they, that we focus our time with Harry, we get to find out how this all happened. But a part of me does wish that we got to spend, I don't know, maybe that's not, mm. because when you do consider the fact that we're seeing things from Harry's point of view here, and we are also seeing these characters, it's important to note that he does have a lot of love and respect for these women. I think the big problem is that he doesn't have a lot of love and respect for himself. And that ends up being a huge problem and that ends up causing a lot of problems for those that come in contact with him. Not everyone who watches The Bigamist is going to understand what it's trying to say. 
But what I believe it's trying to say is that the way the world works does not make it easy for men and women to converse and really tell each other how they're filming. They're filming and tell each other how they're feeling. And it doesn't respect and the way that we discuss and approach certain topics really hinders the way men and women approach things and they approach things differently but the way they approach certain things are told to them through the media and are told from the way they're raised and everything that they see around them and that's definitely a very condensed version of what I think they're trying to say um, but it's really saying F the page I was going to like be like this. It's really saying after the patriarchy, um, it doesn't really help anybody. And I, I don't know if, you know, that was among the conversations that were being had between Collier Young and Ida Lupino, but she, I love the way that she approaches things. And if you ever come to see The Trouble with Angels, she really knows how to bring her female characters to life in a way that allows them to be both very sympathetic but you also they're not perfect they're not put on any kind of pedestal they're not the angel on top of the tree they are human they make their own mistakes and you know at the end of the day you have phyllis who is very much a person who oh she's found somebody that she really loves and she wants to appease him and she doesn't want to make him feel that he's done anything wrong or ever did anything wrong and you have Eve who's really pulled away from her marriage a bit and there she has every right to grieve and she has every right to grieve the thought of her actually being able to carry a child and how she handles that is how she handles that but it's just more so about the way that we as humans communicate with each other and how things like the patriarchy can really put a put a dent in that put a hedge what is that like uh, can really just you know make that whole thing difficult <laughs> so if you have not seen the bigamist i highly recommend that you do watch it at least once i'm really here with stephen j schneider i believe this is a movie that would be great to see at least once in your lifetime I have it linked below, the version that I watched especially, but where else you can watch it, along with various articles. I am so happy that you decided to click on this video, and if you've made it to this point, thank you so much. If you enjoyed it, give it a like, and if you haven't already, subscribe and ring that bell to be notified every single time I post. I would love to have you here on The Quiet Riot and see you again. Feel free to comment below your thoughts on The Bigamist and your thoughts in the way films deal with things such as patriarchy and deals with some taboo subjects. And let me know if there's anything you would like to see on the channel in the future. Thank you again, and I'll see you next time. Bye!